Welcome into Rounding the Bases, the podcast about culture and leadership with a baseball twist presented by Community America Credit Union. I'm Joel Goldberg and uh, got an amazing show coming up. Actually, a return guest who was uh, on this podcast a while back talking about his first book, which was really interesting. And the second one that he recently has out will be as interesting. Uh, my guest is John Gronsky, retired major general, so that's two-star general, and uh, CEO, founder of Leader Grove. He's the author of Ride of Our Lives, Lessons on Life, Leadership, and Love. That was the topic of the first time that I had General Gronsky on, and it was uh, a reflection back on a time in his younger years where he and his wife and their, their young baby biked, like bicycle, not motorcycle, biked across the country, and there were just amazing lessons in this. Um, his new book is Iron Sharpened Leadership, Transforming Hard-Fought Lessons into Action, and it is available now. We'll tell you how to get all of that. But, you know, I've said this many times before that I, I love interviewing members of our military, whether active or retired, because they have so many important lessons that can apply to any one of us in our personal lives, in business, in sports, whatever it might be, because the stakes are so high. And when you're in a leadership uh, when you're at a leadership level that John Gronsky was, you have to have figured out how to make this work, oftentimes in dire circumstances. And so really excited right now to bring in a, a gentleman that I have had the chance to get to know over the last couple of years from his home, I believe, in Pennsylvania, General John Gronsky. John, how are you? Hey, Joel, I am doing fantastic. I really appreciate you hosting me on your on your podcast again. Thank you so much. Well, it's good to have you back, and I would certainly let everybody know to to go back and take a look at the last podcast. I was looking it up. It's episode 422, August 17th of 2020, which, boy, that was less than a year ago, but it, it feels to me like it was five years ago with just the way the, the world has been changing. So I guess we are knee-deep in the pandemic. Now we're coming out. How how is How have these recent months been for you and working on a new book and releasing that? How have you spent your time? Yeah, you know, I've uh, spent my time just trying to learn and, and get better, you know, stay physically fit, mentally fit, emotionally fit, spiritually fit. Uh, so uh, that, that, that's what I've been doing. My wife and I still do a lot of bicycle riding, uh, a lot of hiking. We have a new member of the family, uh, our, our dog, Scotty, uh, who's keeping us busy. And of course, my two sons, uh, they're just fantastic. They're both in their 30s. So uh that's why I say a, a very new addition with, with our 10-month-old dog, Scotty. Well, I mean, that's exciting. And I, I know that your sons were such an important part of that first book. And I, if I remember correctly, it was your youngest son who wasn't alive at that point that really encouraged you to write this. It was such a beautiful story because it was so personal. And, you know, I still have these visions of, I think it was like a, a bull chasing you guys down the, the street at one point. And, you know, the the just the awakenings that you had. Uh, along the way and, and experiencing people. And, and I just want to touch back on that before we move on to the new book, because I, I thought about that. And I, I know you and I talked about it a little bit. There's so much animosity in this country right now. And, and there, there should be so much more togetherness. You, you know, we did not rally around this pandemic the way we did 9-11. But I think that you saw all parts of the country and all walks of life. And I, I think that you, I, I, I just wonder how much you thought back to that during these tough times in terms of the goodness of people. Yeah, the, the, these uh, last 15 months or so have been very tough for, for so many people for a variety of reasons, of course. Uh, but, you know, I, I still do a lot of work with uh, young people, uh, college-aged uh, uh, men and women. Uh, I do some work at a local university. I also do some work with the YMCA. And I will tell you, just from working with those uh, 20-somethings, uh, I feel really good about the future. Uh, they seem very positive, willing to learn, uh, have good character. And uh, that that makes me uh, feel good about what's in store for our country for years to come. Yeah, I'm an optimist. There, there are days where it's tough to be, and that's not a matter of which side you're on. It's just a matter of that there are so often two sides to this and it's like wait a minute we're we're all americans here so it, it, it's a work in progress i guess this country always has been a work in progress and and when you have good leadership that certainly helps so i'm curious with this second book i mean the first one 
while it had, I, I think, as many lessons in that book as this one, and I've just had a chance to gloss a glance over the the digital copy of it, but that one was very personal, right? I mean, that was the most intimate of journeys with with you and your wife, and and at the time your 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 baby son. This one is different. Tell me how much different this was. Yeah, well, I, I think this is really uh, quite a personal book too. Uh, I have a lot of um, uh, stories in there, not necessarily about myself, but about people that I've had relationships with and that I've I've served with in the military and in other uh, areas of, of my life. Uh, so most of the uh, so uh, the this new book, Iron Sharpened Leadership, is really a compilation of a series of stories about people who made an impact in my life and who have really taught me how to be a better leader. So I hear Scotty, by the way, in the background there, I, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I think that is Scotty. And uh, um, my wife is failing me. I thought she would be babysitting right now, but uh, apparently Listen. he escaped. This is the world that we live in. It is very normal now to hear a dog barking in the background on a, uh, it could be on CNN, it could be on a podcast. It doesn't really make a difference. So we're just, you know, I, I'm just happy that Scotty's making an appearance and um, that's yeah, okay. Joel, I'm, I'm just going to open up the door and let him in. He probably yeah, heard him about in. you and he wanted to meet you. Well, the, the, see, it's always good to be able to get a, uh, an extra guest on the podcast. So, you know, look, I can roll with anything. I've been doing live TV for a long time. So if a dog wants to come in and join the show, by all means. So what, what's your biggest takeaway from this book? I mean, I, I feel like you have this purpose in life, certainly your post-military life, of being able to share so many of the lessons that you learned, serving over in some of the most difficult places and having massive amounts of people under your command. That doesn't happen by accident. And that certainly comes with learning a lot of lessons, which I think is what you're trying to do and share this here and to the groups that you speak. What, what were some of your biggest takeaways? Yeah. Well, you know, Joel, this, this book, uh, you know, somebody asked me a question, how long did it take me to write the book? The book really took me 40 years to write. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a compilation of 40 years of, of my experience uh, serving as a leader, both in the military and in the civilian sector. And uh, the, the lessons I've learned in this book really span that, that amount of time. So um, really in the Army, we talk about after action reviews. And what an after action review is, is after you do a training event or an operation, you kind of go back and you reflect on, hey, what went right? Uh, you know, what went wrong that we want to improve next time? What lessons did we learn? And so this book is really like an after action review of, uh, of various uh, aspects of leadership. How, how much along the way, I mean, I know that, that the, as I've gotten to know you a little bit, I know that you're, I think you're a deep thinker. You, you, you know, you read, you're, you're, you're very engaged uh, mentally, physically, all of that. You take great care of yourself. So along the way, as you're on this journey and, and you're, you know, you're serving overseas and you're in some, you know, some pretty difficult places. How much were you taking notes or how much were you taking stock of what was going along amidst all? Because I always feel like, it, you know, I, I'll give you this example. So we, we have a, a player right now in the Royals that that is really struggling, uh, much more so than he expected, than anyone expected. And it's not a slump of two weeks. It's been the whole season. And, you know, he's just trying to work hard and, and, and still – trust his process and, and put in the work. And he said something to me last week. He said, I, I keep reminding myself that three or four years down the road, I'm going to look back and see somebody else struggling and be able to help him based on what I'm going through. So like, how, how present were you while you were serving, while you were leading at the highest of levels of taking stock of all of this? Yeah, uh, I think that is a great point. Uh, the way I get through challenging times, whether it be the COVID situation we all went through, whether it be leading a brigade in Ramadi, Iraq in 2005 and six, when it was very violent there, uh, as I look back on past challenges I had, uh, times when I, you know, things were kind of dark and gloomy and how I made it through those times 
And when I think back on, on how I made it through tough times, it helps me to be more optimistic about the present circumstance I'm in. So, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about uh, the need for leaders to be optimistic. And when I say leaders need to be optimistic, it isn't uh, about putting a pair of rose colored glasses on. It's about believing that tomorrow is going to be a better day than today is. Mm -hmm. And and I think leaders have to, um, you know, just, just inspire uh, the people that are following them that, hey, we're going through a tough time now, but tomorrow is going to be better. Easier said than done, though, right? Yes, it is. And uh, sometimes, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, you know, sometimes in those tough times in Ramadi, Iraq, um, I had to almost fake the optimism. Uh, but I knew it was important to those who were following me uh, that, that I had to put that uh, – you know, the, just just that feeling of an optimistic attitude out there. Even if I had my own self doubts, I couldn't let my followers perceive the those self doubts. I had to I had to keep them inspired. I had to keep them motivated. I had them I had to keep them believing that hey, the purpose we were uh, there for serving was was the right purpose, and again, we were going to be successful in the end. There's a fine line there too, because if you're Debbie Downer all the time which would be very easy to do. Everyone's going to follow you on that. At the same time, if those rose colored glasses, or if that belief, maybe they're not, it's not rose colored glasses, but if that optimistic belief that tomorrow is going to be better than today doesn't seem genuine, isn't believable, then they're not going to buy that either. Right. I mean, there's a, there, there's a, there's a delicate balance in the way you find that that hope and that optimism, isn't there? You know, you know, Joel, this is a perfect conversation because you are exactly right. And I think what it comes down to is is being authentic and having integrity and being upfront about the challenges that you're currently facing. You can't make light of those challenges or you can't tell people, hey, this really isn't so bad because people know it's bad. Uh, so you, you, you've, you've got to be upfront about that but at the same token, you, you have to explain to them that, hey, this is the plan we have to be more successful, to get through these hard times. So, again, being authentic and, and realistic about the tough time you're in, but also uh, putting forth a plan and a vision for how you're going to move forward and be successful. For anyone that wants to find out more about the book, you can go to johngronsky.com, G-R-O-N-S-K-I, johngronsky.com. That'll certainly, a link to that will be in the show notes. And actually, you can you can purchase or learn more about either of his books on there. I mentioned that this, well, I suggested that this was less personal than the other one. It's just different. They're both personal. And I, I actually, as I said that, I certainly worthy of correcting because I think anytime you write a book, I've learned this, as you know, in the last year it's very personal because you put so much heart and time into it. And you said that you've been writing this one in essence for, you know, your whole career, but what was the process like in putting it all together and figuring out, I mean, you, you, I'm not exaggerating when I'm exaggerating when I say that you have a lifetime of lessons, you can only share so many of them. I know for me, that was one of the hardest things in the book. What do I pick? What don't I pick? That's true on TV every single day. I mean, you, you know, you only have a, a finite amount of time. So what was that process like for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, Joel, I want to say I loved your book. Uh, Thank you. you're, you're a storyteller and an inspirational storyteller. And I just gained so much from that. So so thank you for the, the content you put out thank there. You. Uh, in terms of my book, I, I really based it on my leadership philosophy, uh, and my leadership ship, uh, philosophy includes uh, character, competence, and resilience. So I, I broke the book down into those three sections, and then there's some subsections in there. And the chapters are relatively short, and, and they're and they're all oriented uh, toward those three elements of my leadership philosophy. So that's that's how I put the, the book together. And when I when I uh, you know used that path and that process, it was actually uh, uh, pretty uh, exciting and and uh, easy for me to uh, you know put the chapters together along those lines. Was the feeling different when this one came out than the first one? I I don't know. I haven't had a second book yet, but mm -hmm. but I think that first one 
to me felt like, you know, the birth of a child. It's a, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's like, wow, this, you know, this is mine. Uh, how was the, the second round of that for you? Yeah, well, you know, the first book I put together was really more for uh, my my kids and my grandkids mm. uh, to really document that amazing story of bicycling across the country in 1983 with a 15 month old baby. Um, so, you know, it was more it was more for my family. But as it turned out, uh, people just loved reading that book and it, and it sold quite well. So this book, uh, Iron Sharpened Leadership is really more about me giving back, you know, uh, paying forward. Uh, all the lessons I learned, I just felt it would be valuable for aspiring leaders and, and those currently in leadership positions to read some of the lessons and learn from them. And I believe everyone, no matter who you are, could develop to be a stronger leader than, than who you are today. And so that, that, that's my hope for this book, that it will help people become stronger leaders. Well, and you know, stronger tomorrow than today. It's the same point that you made about tomorrow being better. And and we all, uh, I, I have yet to hear anybody that says they have it all figured out. There are a lot of people that act like they have it all figured out, but I, I think the best of them, and I see this in baseball, I see this with CEOs as they say, look, I, I want to learn something new today. I'll learn something new from you have during this conversation and, and the next one and the next one. And that's, you know, that, that, that's a matter of paying attention. So, you mentioned those three words that are so important to you, character, competence, and resilience. Are those traits that can be approved upon? Can you become a more resilient person? Can you, like, I, I know there are a lot of times where I'm just lazy. Uh, there, I, I, you know, there, but I, I also know that I've always been someone that loves to get down dirty and work and let, let's go. Um, I believe in my character, but there are a lot of people I see that whose character I don't believe in. Can, can we teach these traits? A absolutely. I absolutely positively. I think we could teach anyone to have uh, uh, stronger values, better values. Uh, I like to, I, I learned about values from reading a book uh, called Courage, the Backbone of Leadership by Gus Lee. And he's the first uh, one uh, who I, I came across that talked about values in terms of, hey, there's low values, there's medium values, and then there's high values. Uh, to give you an example of, of a low value, a low value would be uh, racism or a low value would be cronyism. I mean, there's some people who unfortunately value those things. And then there's medium values such as loyalty. But he goes on to say that the two high values are, are uh, courage and integrity. And uh, I strive to have personal courage in terms of moral courage and also in terms of integrity, doing the right thing re regardless of risk is, is a way to, to define that. So yeah, I think from a character basis, people can improve from a comp competence basis. When I talk about competence in my book, I'm talking about the competence to provide a vision, a competence to help uh, develop other leaders within your organization, the competence to communicate well, because I think leadership is about 90% communicating uh, to those that you lead. And then in terms of resilience, uh, that that's where I talk about uh, the importance of a leader allowing themselves to be vulnerable, moving out of their comfort zone in order to become a, 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 in, in order to become more resilient and also in order to help those that follow you become more resilient as well. That vulnerability piece is hard for a lot of people, I feel like. I, I mean, I, I, I feel like a lot of times so many people are caught in the middle of, well, I don't want to show vulnerability because somehow that will show weakness and I need to be able to prove myself. Yet I've always found that when you either admit what you don't know or you you respect someone else's and value someone else's opinion, that it, it builds better a better relationship, better trust, and, and leads to that character. Yeah, absolutely. And, and let's face it, Joel, the people we lead are not stupid. The people we lead are smart. Uh, what the people we lead want a leader who is authentic. They want a leader who is going to admit when they don't know something. And if, if a leader thinks that they could just pull the wool over everybody's eyes and, and, and make everybody think that they're all knowing and all knowledgeable, uh, they're going down a wrong path. So, uh, you know, to allow yourself to be vulnerable allows yourself to be authentic. It allows yourself to be able to build trust in the organization. And it also shows people that you respect them. 
uh, you know, that you don't think they're that they're they're fools. And and uh, I always like to say, if you don't want to be called a toxic leader, simply treat the people you lead with dignity and respect. And it's almost impossible to be called a toxic leader if you treat people that way. I love that. That's such a great lesson and and one that I think a lot of people miss. I really do. And it's not a difficult one if you can let that guard down a little bit and, and bring people in with that vulnerability. All right, let's go to our second round of baseball-themed questions. So we can't go back to where we did before. You can. I mean, I'm not going to buzz you out like Family Feud or something like that. But let's talk just in terms of – how about this? In terms uh, in terms of iron sharpened leadership or maybe in terms of this last year with the pandemic um, – uh, and I can be back to your whole career, I suppose, too. In terms of leadership, biggest home run that you've hit? Um, yeah, I'd say the biggest home run that I hit was having to honor uh, to lead that brigade in Ramadi, Iraq, and then moving forward after that and having to honor to command the 28th Infantry Division, a, uh, a military outfit of 15,000 soldiers. So uh, both both of those positions I had uh, – Really, uh, it was just an honor for me because it meant serving with soldiers, men and women who I respected so much. For people that are leading a large amount of people, you, you can't get to know all 15,000 of them, right? But there are, there are a level that uh, of people that you're leading among that 15,000 that you do have to be very close with and do have to be able to entrust them and empower them. How did you go about that? How, how, how close... How many people did you need to get close with to be able to allow those layers and those um, those after effects of your leadership to spread elsewhere? Yeah, uh, a couple of things on that. First of all, I do think you need to build a team of trusted advisors around you, and, and that's very important. But, you know, you mentioned that I read a lot, and I do read a lot. And one of the books I read uh, a few years ago was a book by uh, a British field marshal. His name was Slim, and he uh, commanded... Uh, Thousands, hundreds of thousands of troops in the India China Burma theater. And in his book, The Feet into Victory, he said, when a leader is leading a large organization of thousands of people, he said it's impossible for that leader to get to know every one of those people. However, it's important that the leader puts forth the effort so every one of those people gets to know the leader. And I thought that was profound. You know, you can't get to know, you know, all 15,000 of the people you you lead in a in an army division. But by getting around, uh, by uh, ensuring that you get out and, and you're with the troops or with your employees in a civilian company, you could ensure that all of those people get to know who you are. And that's really the trick when you're leading a, a large organization. So, again, it's building that that uh, small team of trusted advisors around you. And then also getting out and about and, and getting those people in your organization to know who you are and what you're all about. Fascinating. It is. And I think that applies to all leaders. You could scale it down or scale it up as needed. How about a swing and a miss throughout all of this? Huh. A swing and a miss. Uh, probably just uh, some missed opportunities to perhaps uh, help as many people as I could during the, uh, the period of COVID. You know, we were all kind of secluded. People were kind of shut down. And uh, I think the swing and the miss was maybe I could have done a little bit more to have made myself a little bit more accessible to to help other people. And then small ball, and it may fall on into that because if you did miss on some things, we all do. I, I see you so active on, um, you know, whether it be writing or whether it be videos. And, and I love that too, because I, I feel like, you know, and, and you're older than me, but I'm I'm still older than a, a lot of the people that I'm around now, certainly the baseball players. And, you know, they're living in that video world. They're doing all of those social media stuff. And and so I know for me, it's important not to let that pass me by. And I feel like that's been the same thing with you, too. I, I don't know that that's an element of small ball for you, but it feels like you you really get a lot of those things right. What What is what is small ball been to you in this last year? Uh, you know what I think small ball is, I, uh, in, in my view, is is care. Uh, you know, when we talk about leadership, sometimes we don't talk about care enough. And, and I think there's three elements of care. Uh, first of all, as a leader, you've got to care for yourself. You've got to take care of yourself so you're so you're strong. Uh, you know, you're 
you're technically and, and, and tactically proficient in whatever area you need to be, you're healthy, et cetera, et cetera. So you got to care for yourself. Then you've got to care for those people that you lead. You've got to show to people that you lead that you care more for their welfare than you care about your own welfare. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is you've got to care about your organization that you lead. And I, I talk about ambition. And I say, you know, you know, no, a leader shouldn't be ambitious for their own career success, but a leader needs to be ambitious for the success of the organization that they lead. So I think care is a, is a great uh, small ball uh, technique to use when you're leading any organization. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And really something, again, that we all can live by. And you can get so many of these lessons in John's new book, Iron Sharpened Leadership, which uh, we're releasing this here just after uh, the audio for this podcast, just after the book comes out. So you can get that at johngronsky.com or on Amazon. All right, four final questions as we wrap it up. You mentioned that you and your wife still go on bike rides. I don't think you're going to crisscross the country from you know, the Pacific Northwest out to Pennsylvania again, but what, what would, what's the longest that you guys would consider? Yeah, we, um, you know, we're, we're thinking of biking from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, there's a series of bike trails. It would probably take us about uh, five days to do it. And uh, that that's on our list of things to do. If not this year, then the next year. But that that's that's a trip that we would love to do together. That's fantastic. And I, I'm not I, you just strike me. Obviously, I haven't met your wife, but certainly read about her. So you both strike me as the the type of people that are, are never going to be sitting on the couch too long that <laughs> I'm not saying you don't have your moments of relaxing or, or whatever it is, but I think you're, you, it seems to me like the two of you are going to be active uh, as long as you're on this earth and you still have many, many years to be. So I'm not surprised by that at all. Second question, it'll be along the same things. I know how important it is for you to take care of yourself. I could use a little bit of inspiration and motivation because I I'm up and down and up and down and, and, and I definitely let life get in the way a little bit too much, but I know you're very disciplined. That's not just a military thing. Not everybody that is done with the military is disciplined. I know a lot of guys and gals that are, what, what is your daily routine look like? Yeah. My daily routine is I get up between five and five 30, uh, you know, I have a gym membership. So I, I go to the gym or I'm out there for a run. I, I try to do something physic, uh, in terms of physical fitness early in the morning and then throughout the day, you know, get out for a bike ride, get out for a hike, just, just to walk around the neighborhood with the dog, just, just, just to keep moving. And I, I firmly believe that people shouldn't only strive to work out in the morning, which I think is a good thing, but in other times throughout the day, get up, move around, and, and keep that body active. All right. Third question, as we round the bases, we'll, we'll go back to some of those, I guess what I'd call hairy moments over there, you know, over in, in Iraq. It, it feels at least to me like that's what, where my mind goes, that the toughest moments. And, and I suppose those are the, the great learning moments. And you write about a lot of that, but how about a great moment over there? I mean, I, I've, I've always felt like one of the beauties of being in the military, I don't know, I didn't serve like you and so many have, is that you get to experience so many parts of the world that none of us will ever see. And we only hear about the bad stuff, of course. Uh, how, how about a, a good memory? Yeah, I, I think a, a good memory, not necessarily being in Iraq, is, you know, it's funny, Joel. I, I remember waking up some mornings in Iraq, and it was just a gorgeous morning. The weather was so nice at times. And I would have that feeling of, wow, this is a, a, just a beautiful morning for about 30 seconds. And then I would remember what would be in store for, you know, the soldiers and Marines who were under my command for the balance of that day. And the, so that memory would fade quick. However, um, you know, the last three years of my military career, 2016 to 2019, I had the opportunity to serve as one of the deputy commanding generals at U.S. Army Europe and uh, had the opportunity to travel to about 40 countries throughout Europe uh, while I was over there on business. Uh, just, uh, you know, being with our soldiers as they were training over there, being with our NATO allies and other European partners, and just seeing uh, that cohesion of NATO and, and how all these NATO countries working together uh, against a common goal uh, was, was just so important to 
uh, our, our transatlantic uh, security. So uh, just had a fantastic time uh, working with our soldiers and, and with our foreign allies and partners over there. All right. Last question as we wrap it up. And you know, of course, I'll, I'll thank you for all of your service. But I, I learned when I went over to Kuwait, I know you and I have talked about this, is that I also, I don't know that you'll listen or not, but I, I would want to thank your wife because what I learned over there was, was you know, all the soldiers and uh, officers and everybody that I talked to, they, they said, don't thank us. We're just doing our job. Uh, thank our families for the sacrifice they made. And I got to tell you, it is so nice now. You know, we didn't we didn't have fans last year in the stadium. And now I see some of some of these soldiers that I met over in Kuwait at the stadium and they're coming by to say hi and they're doing well. It's, it's the coolest thing, you know, to see them back home. And I have so much respect for them. One, one of them, um, I think he told me the other night at the stadium, just got promoted to staff sergeant. He's trying to follow in his dad's footsteps and he's, you know, National Guard. And he's uh, his name's Nicola Day. Uh, I wrote about him briefly in the book and he he's doing a lot of recruiting now for them as well. And he said, it's, it's getting harder. He's like, it's, it, it's getting harder to convince this next generation to, to join, to sign up. I'm just curious your thoughts on that. I mean, where, where we're at right now, Th this thing comes in cycles, right? It, 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 there's a pendulum effect to it, but what, what would you tell any, you know, young teenagers that might have this opportunity? Yeah, you know, I've I've talked to a lot of uh, people, 60s and 70s, who never served in the military, and 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 most of them always told me their greatest regret was never serving in the military. So I would encourage any young person to uh, look at the military as, as an option. You don't need to stay in for 20 years, but go in and 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 gain some uh, great experience and meet some great people. But then I also like to say there's other ways to serve your community, your state, your country than serving in a military uniform. There's many different ways to serve. So I, I think the point is for young people to uh, understand that you need to have a sense of service. There's something out there just greater than your individual self and, and, and find a way that you feel comfortable with serving. And there's many ways to do that. Great advice, great perspective. I knew it would be. The new book is Iron Sharpened Leadership. Again, you could find that at johngronsky.com. John is J-O-H-N. Gronsky is G-R-O-N-S-K-I. That's going to be easy to figure out. It's in the notes. It's also in the title and all of this for this podcast. You could also get it on Amazon. Also encourage everybody to go to, go to the website because um, a lot of good blogs and a lot of just, just good content that'll help you be a better leader, a better person uh, on a very regular basis. And so, John, congrats on book number two. It's always good to see you. I, I look forward to catching up with you again uh, offline, and I appreciate the time. Hey, Joel, thank you again for hosting me. I love your content. Keep it up. All right. Thanks, John. Take care.